Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. So glad to be talking on this episode with author Danny Fingeroff. Danny, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks thank for joining you. me. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Well, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for saying yes. Um, <laughs> glad to talk to you about the world of comics, the the world of teaching. You have a number of uh, projects that we need to talk about as well. Um, yeah, so so generally curious about, uh, first of all, just, just what has kind of led you to this world of writing and creating stories and story worlds, uh, including biographies. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just something I've done since I was a kid. Um, I... Um, I loved stories. I loved, and I loved comics. You know, it was there was something about the medium. I mean, you know, I watched. You know, I'm a, I'm a dare I say it a baby boomer. So I watch. You know, I I watch a lot of TV and all different kinds of things in the new. You know, the the main networks and the New York local channels, which had a lot of kind of oddball stuff. And then somewhere, and I have to make sure to mention my cousin Steve, because I think I did one podcast where I didn't credit him with helping <laughs> foster my interest in comics, and he took me to task for it at a, at a family function the other day. <laughs> so my cousin Steve uh, was a comics reader. I remember him giving me, uh, you know, uh, Superboy or Adventure Comics, and I guess other DC comics, and... and uh, you know, we had we were, you know I lived in the heyday of newspaper comics, especially in New York City with Dick Tracy and Orphan Annie and Dondi and uh, and oddly enough, even the New York Post, in the uh, which was a different New York Post back then, mm -hmm. uh, had had uh, comics and Sunday color comics. So there was something I was comfortable. I was a big fan of the Popeye cartoons on TV, and my mom. Uh, somebody got me Popeye uh, comic books, whatever it was. I was take I was taken by the medium, uh, and so I, you know, I was always writing stuff and and uh, and drawing stuff. Uh, but it, but it was spurred, you know, sort of the the medium that was most accessible to me and most understandable to me as a kid was comic books and comic strips. So I guess that's. You know, and then and then sort of the next step, and I was I was always a superhero guy. I liked other comics. I read oddly enough, like I remember reading Sad Sack, and even in the barber shop, I'd read Millie the Model because, of course, I guess that's what a kid's gonna part with from his collection to give to the local barber. So I was reading Stan Lee stuff even before I knew that who Stan Lee was or what he was. Mm -hmm. But I was, I, I was very into the superhero stuff. And then I was the perfect age for the very beginning of Marvel Comics, you know, modern Marvel Comics in 1961. I was a little bit late. I didn't get to Marvel till Fantastic Four number four. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah. But then I was able to get issue two at a secondhand magazine shop for a nickel because it was used. It was an old wow. copy. So of wow. course the value would go down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course. That's yeah. that, of course that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't think, I never owned number one. I don't think I own number three, but everything from four on, you know. So that that you know, and, and again there was something what Stan and Jack and Stan and Steve were doing in those comics just hit me square in the center of my brain. You know, uh -huh. I didn't even know that I was kind of getting jaded with the DC and the uh, Archie comics. I read Archie and I read the Archie Adventure comics, but those Marvels really uh, were, were um, for their day, realistic and, and, uh, and intense, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't know if somebody reading them, you know, if somebody young reading them now would get the same, jolt out of them but they were real and then of course there was the added uh the letter columns where stan didn't just answer the letters but really developed a very you know what felt like a personal relationship with the with the readers mm -hmm. where, where um he would have these before the bullpen bulletins were formalized he would write a separate 
series of um, promotions and just informational things and bonding things in each yeah. letter column. And you knew that was the same voice speaking in the captions of the stories and the same voice speaking to you on the cover. It really, it was, it was a, it was a unified message. And if you were tuned into it, it was really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So then you went on to be an editor at Marvel later on for, I think it was 18 years. Is that right? I was, I, I worked yeah, in various writing and editing capacities there for 18 years. I started, you know, I, I studied filmmaking in college. Mm hmm. Just sort of a natural outgrowth, I think, of you know words and pictures, words and images to tell a story or convey a feeling. And uh, you know, I was born, uh, I was born and raised in Manhattan, you know, which makes me, as I you know, as I like to say to people, the most provincial person you'll ever you'll ever meet. I grew up on a small island uh, off the east coast of the United States, and um, and so I came home from college. But for me, coming home was coming home to Manhattan. So it was like, well, maybe I'll gamble the twenty-five cents on a subway token, and and I had a, I had, a, I had enough of a connection to get into Marvel on an informational tour. You know, mm -hmm. somebody would, walk, you know, an intern would walk me around, and well, and that led to me running into somebody I went to high school. Anyway, um, I got an entry-level job maybe a uh, six or eight months later working. For Larry Lieber, who was Stan Lee's brother, who was running what we call the British Department, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a series of mostly reprinted some new material, including Captain Britain, that was on sale uh, in England, black and white, kind of repackaged stuff. So that was, you know, that was sort of exploring. I, I knew I would, you know, I knew I was fated to do something creative or creative e, as I like to call, you know. And the uh, comics seemed like, okay, well, let me explore this for a few months. And, yeah, it turned into 18 years of, you know, I worked for Larry, who still, I'm still friends with, who's still around. He just finished writing his first novel, his first nice. prose novel at age 91, you know. Love it, love it. Yeah. And, um, um, and then I proceeded through, I was, a, I was a general assistant, and I was Louise Simonson's assistant on the X-Men, then I, uh, was the editor of a couple of different phases of Spider Man, and I wrote a lot of stuff. I wrote Dark Hawk and uh, Dazzler and mm -hmm. a bunch of Spider Man stuff. But I'm, I guess I'm best known as the editor of Spider Man for a long time. And so you had the chance to have a, a variety of connections with Stanley, in yeah. that you you are still friends with his brother. You got to edit some of his work, I believe, if, I, if I'm reading that correctly. Mm -hmm. And you also wrote a biography of him, A uh, Marvelous Life. Right. It, you, you are correct. You've done your homework. You know? Well, I try. I try. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it is interesting. You know, I mean, as you know, or maybe as some of your the listeners, viewers, I don't know what medium people are going to access this, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's Stan is weirdly more controversial than ever you know mm -hmm. so that whole thing who did what and you know yeah i think I, I i would say that i was friendly with stan i was colleagues with stan we did work together on stuff i was his moderator at a series of conventions for a few years the wizard world shows mm -hmm. um but i would never consider myself in his inner circle you know i was certainly you know i wasn't social pals with him mm -hmm. um so I think that put me. Other people may differ. Um, that would that would consist of the list of people I've blocked on social media. People sure. Differ, people <laughs> differ way too, um, way too uh, insultingly, you know. But right. <laughs> but most people seem to think that the biography is pretty even-handed as far as talking about him and, uh, and Kirby and Ditko. You can read it for yourself. You can even listen to the audio book, which I read, my, which I did the reading for, if that's your idea of a good time. Oh, nice, nice. you like this, listening to this, imagine 14 hours of it pumped into your head, you know? Long, so, long car trips, <laughs> uh, all the things, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, uh, so no, you know, and knowing, look, knowing Stan is interesting in, you know, reading stuff about him. He didn't always do the right thing. He didn't always do, but he did the right thing more often than not. Mm -hmm. 
you know, um, um, there was, uh, well, you know, Abraham Reisman, who wrote a much more negative uh, biography of Stan. He and I were doing a podcast together mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago. And uh, he said to me, well, you know, he said, one thing I realized, you know, from your book, Danny, um, was that whatever fault Stan had compared to the other I'm paraphrasing him now. That's not exactly what, but compared to the other editors of his generation, he was a saint. You know? so, uh, <laughs> so it was sort of damning with faint praise. But I mean, that's, you know, I mean, what these guys were doing in literally 60 years ago, mm -hmm. that, I mean, here's, here's this leap of imagination, right? They're like, guys trying to make a living any which way they can to think that that you and i would be on some medium called the internet doing something called a podcast 60 years ago talking about that stuff was mm -hmm. so far from their minds oh yeah yeah just i mean it, it's you know um it, it you know to, to sort of to scrutinize stuff that people did 50 60 years ago in the you know just is it was so far from from sort of the the fight to survive and make a living and and in, in what everybody regarded as a dying medium and mm -hmm. and really a not even second class would have been good third or fourth class medium you know yeah just you know there was it was still the days when you know i mean stan would tell this story but i've, I've had similar experiences even even in our era of more you know where comics are allegedly more accepted and more popular, and mm -hmm. and I guess they are. You know, but I mean, you know, you go to Stan would talk about going to a party, and I, I mean, yeah, I think it's happened to everybody. And go to a party, and somebody say, uh, "What do you do?" And and you do everything you could to avoid saying you worked in comics. You know, and finally, you have to admit that you worked in comics, and they find an excuse to go talk to somebody else my mm -hmm. version is i had a friend who years ago was trying to impress a woman at a party and he said oh you know my friend danny works at marvel comics and uh her response was do you know where the cheese is you know <laughs> <laughs> wow. so she, uh, <laughs> didn't, uh, the things worked out for him he's happily married and tall. well good good <laughs> But that not not to that woman though. You know? <laughs> I was gonna say, was it the cheese woman? Um, right, yeah. that, would been, that would have been a great punk club, but no. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. There, there are a couple of lines that you have in Stanley in the in your book on Stanley that I, I find really interesting. One of which is he was working in a medium that was reviled by anybody over the age of fourteen, um, and then <laughs> the <laughs> other. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing that you say is, um, you know, he's, he people have said, was he just lucky? Was he just sort of a manipulative person? And uh, the point that you make there is that if if he was, which doesn't seem to be the case, he, he was lucky for 75 years, which is right. a long time to be lucky. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah and but, yes, exactly. I mean, and it's kind of I mean, since, you know, I'd be. I'm sort of in the in the world of biographers in the past uh, four or five years. Mm -hmm. Sort of one thing, it it it's it's kind of a almost a tautology. There are very few people you can write a biography of or who you've heard of. You know, I mean, you can say that he was a ruthless careerist. Well, yeah, if he wasn't a ruthless careerist, he never would have heard of the guy. You know, I mean, it's sort of it's sort of part. You know, I'm, I mean, there are exceptions, obviously, but uh, uh, in general. Um, it, it just sort of, you know, so to say that, uh, you know, I mean, maybe Stan, oddly enough, you know, Stan waited a long time for success, you know, I mean, he was, mm -hmm. he was financially comfortable, but, you know, even as wealthy as he was, and I have no idea what his wealth was, but I would say for a guy who, who, and, you know, certainly on the official contract, whatever, on the official record, co-created all those characters was not as wealthy as he should have been, you know, for somebody mm. 
with that. Yeah. Like I said, don't you know, don't cry for him. He did fine, you know. Uh, did yeah, fine. But considering uh, the the uh, intellectual property and move, you know, and, and characters he was involved with, um, should have you know, someone else who was more ruthless and uh, you know. And I know people are going to go, oh, but he was so, you know, I don't know, maybe, you, you know, it's, it, but it's a funny, it's a funny thing. So you, yeah, in the world of biography, uh, you just learn that, okay, uh, you know, I, I don't even remember what question I was answering. So, so. Oh, know. yeah, yeah. I was just saying uh, <laughs> that I appreciated the, the way you talked about him in the book and the, oh, the fair well, and even handedness. Stanley and. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I try. I tried, and I hope I succeeded. Although, you know, for some people, it's never you know. Yeah. You know, I mean, my my joke. I mean, again, this is, uh, you know, that that um, that documentary came out uh, mm -hmm. like, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. Stand, and it's yeah. You know, it's put out by Disney, so of course, you know, and it's literally narrated by Stan. They took, uh, you know, actually a very interesting. You know, craft wise, they took dozens of interviews with him done over the years and spliced them and mm -hmm. you know. Um and and um you know, so it so it incited a lot of the old controversies. Mm -hmm. Um and and um just just weird to see all that. I guess it'll never go away. Um but there was something about the guy. So, you know, so writing a biography of him was a challenge. And, you know, like I said, I think, oh, I, I know what I was going to say. It's, you know, there, there are just people. It's very weird that there uh, are people who seem to feel that Stan, whatever Stan did, you know, sort of, it reminds me of the, of the old um, joke that he had in the Spider-Man comics, you know, where Jonah Jameson would have a headline, Spider-Man, Threat or Menace. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it it kind of feels like that's, you know, um, you know, so it's, 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 you know, so writing biography is very interesting. I went to Stan's archives. I spoke to a lot of, you know, people um, who had worked with him, knew him, just had opinions about him. Uh, you know, and it's sort of, you know, it's very funny, but, you know, and look, like I said, it'll never be an, you know, short of like really comparing Stan to literally Hitler, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. on the internet, everything gets to Hitler eventually, you know, you know it's really, it's, <laughs> the it's internet really, does that really quickly. It yeah. really <laughs> does, you know, um, so I, 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 I just figured, um, well, gee, it wasn't controversial enough writing a biography of Stan Lee. So the, for the next one, I'll write a book about the Kennedy assassination, which is what I've done. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say uh, the the epitaph. Um, he did the right thing more often than not. Is is really it's it's a nice statement. It's it's not a bad epitaph, not a bad epitaph at all. But I don't know if that applies to the the subject of your next biography or not. <laughs> well, you know. Um, well, the next biography that is coming out in November, and, and when I say who it is, you'll know why, is Jack, mm -hmm. not Jack Kirby, Jack Ruby. Although mm -hmm. Jack Kirby did draw a comic about Jack Ruby. For, wow. That uh, was an Esquire magazine in 1967. Huh. Jack Ruby is the guy who, you know, some people, especially younger people, may only know the famous picture of Lee Harvey Oswald being shot by kind of a guy, like a, a stocky guy in a business suit and a fedora. Mm -hmm. That was Jack Ruby, and it's a story that's not very well known, but it's an incredible story. But of course, once you start writing about the Kennedy assassination, you are in the midst of a thousand different conspiracy theories and people mm -hmm. who are utterly, completely sure that they know exactly what happened and why. Um, Ruby was a fascinating guy, um, came from impoverished a Jewish ghetto in Chicago, um, probably mobbed up, moved to Dallas, um, was kind of nutty, he knew a lot of famous people because he was in he was in show business. You know, I'll just give you one factoid that uh, Jack Ruby was the last person to give regular work to Hank Williams Sr. 
Oh, wow. Huh. Besides the strip club, he owned uh, country western clubs. And at the point where Hank Williams was kind of um, deteriorating and nobody, you know, undependable, Ruby was one of the few people who would hire him. So they had a weird relationship. You know, so Ruby shows up. So my feeling was, I'm not solving the case. Sorry. You know, I'm not. Mm -hmm. solving. But if I can shine some light on this really strange, interesting guy. So I've, I talked to, I have notes from his rabbi who visited wow. him in prison like, three times a week. His rabbi was the father. He just, the guy just died at age 99. He was the father of the actor Jonathan Silverman from Weekend at Bernie's. Uh -huh, uh -huh. His father was Jack Ruby's rabbi. Ah. So, These connections. <laughs> yeah. And I spoke, to Ru I spoke to Ruby's niece and nephew. You can imagine, you know, imagine you're like 12 years old and you're bragging to everybody that your uncle owns a strip club because you're 12 years old. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. owns a strip club. And suddenly, and your name is Ruby, and suddenly... He kills Oswald and changes history, and you got to go to school the next day, right? I mean, so I tried to approach it from that kind of angle, and I give, I give credence to a lot of different theories. You know, um, there's so much weird, unexplained, illogical stuff about him and Oswald. So anyway, I'm sure I can only imagine if writing a book about Stanley excited passion, but I think it sold books too. Then, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you know, there are a thousand books about the Kennedy assassination and, but oddly enough, not that much about Jack Ruby, you know, so yeah. it's coming out in, in November. It's called uh, Jack Ruby, the many faces of Oswald's assassin from Chicago review press. And uh, yeah, but that, you know, and oddly enough, that actually started as a graphic novel project about 10 years ago, approaching the 50th anniversary. Um, a, a packager, an editor named Howard Zimmerman, who you may know from his science fiction work, and he worked for many years at, for Byron Price, who was a packager and publisher. Mm -hmm. and I, and I worked together. After I left Marvel, I went to work for Byron. And then Howard, in, in the years since, has become a, a graphic novel packager. And one day we were talking, and I said, you know, I want to do something. You know, it's coming up on the 50th anniversary. It's 10 years ago. I'd love to do something about the Kennedy assassination. What's the Danny Finger Oath angle? Oh, Jack Ruby. Um, so he put me and the artist named Rick Geary together, whose work you would, you would know, if, even if you don't know his name, you would see it. It's a wonder, he's a great artist. He does a lot of, and he actually does a lot of true murder stories. Anyway, mm -hmm. Rick and I put together a proposal and Rick did 10 sample pages. Um, but for various reasons, we couldn't find anybody to find, to finance a year of work sitting, uh, of Rick sitting, doing nothing but this graphic novel. So at one point I said to my agent, what if we tried it as, now that I've written this biography of Stan and a couple of other books, a few other books too, Superman on the Couch, this guy's as Clark Kent, let's see if we can sell it as prose. And 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 we did. And, and uh, hmm. you know, so that that's, that's if anybody's wondering how did Danny get to that, you know, get to like uh, following up Stan Lee, not with Jack Kirby, but with Jack Ruby. Uh, uh, that's how. Um, so it, it it's, um, you know, it's, it's been an, it's an interesting ride, and and it's I guess you'll find I, I guess sort of if you if you're if you're that when you read the book you'll see that I I probably refer like as examples of things or as comparisons of things I probably use comic book uh, examples or metaphors more than the average biographer would. <laughs> <laughs> that but that's an enjoyable thing, uh, absolutely. Um, so the the last thing is we're coming to our last couple yeah. of minutes that I want to make sure to to mention is you're also in the world of um, event planning uh, in a couple of ways, um, both in the past and you also have something coming up called the Jewish Comics Experience. Yeah, that, that's coming up in New York on November 12th, for like a sort of a preview night, November 11th. Uh, I did it with a guy named Fabrice Sapolsky mm -hmm. um, and uh, Fred Polonecki in Brooklyn. We did it a couple of small scale ones and it's been adapted with uh, Fabrice again and uh, a woman named Miriam Mora. And we're putting together, you know, we, we're using a very liberal definition of Jewish, not necessarily religious, ethnic, um, um, uh, philosophical, self-identified. So it's a very broad blanket uh but it's it's called the jewish comics experience 
Um, and and uh, you know there'll be a lot of panel. We can do a lot of stuff leading up to it on the internet. I'll, I can send you when when we have that. Great, it's, uh, great. Yeah. The, 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 it's called the Juice Convention, JWCE, the Jewish Conference Experience. So juice.org or dot edu. Um, and uh, you know, this it's in it's in New York, so um, it's especially for people in the in the Northeast. But if you feel like coming to New York, it's you know, it's at it's, it's at the Center for Jewish Jewish History, which is on Sixteenth Street in Manhattan, uh, West Sixteenth Street. And, and we hope to. Uh, you know, I've been doing one of the things I've been doing over the years. You know, I worked for Wizard World for about four years, doing probably by the time we were through hundreds of panels for them at their convention. So that's so when you say event, I've been uh, event planning and uh, uh, coming up, I don't know when this is airing, but the San Diego Con is next week and I'm doing uh, at least five panels there, including mm -hmm. one about the Kennedy assassination in comics, a bunch about, you know, you can see I've got my Will Eisner cup here. Love I, it, love I'm it. Consultant to the Will Eisner Studios and Fanton Foundations. So I'm doing a lot of Eisner related things. Um so yeah, that's coming up. And again, if you're in San Diego, please uh, stop by the panels. And the the um, yeah, the, you know, if you're interested in, I, I think the Stan Lee book is not just about Stan. I think it's a it's a pretty good history of Marvel at a certain period. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, not not as comprehensive as Sean Howe's book, which I think is the standard on that. Um, but from you know what I bring to that table, certainly was talking about Stan uh, from an in, you know from somebody who knows it's under the hood uh, mm -hmm. and how the sausages are made, which I know is terrible mixed metaphors unless you're like heating <laughs> up the sausages on your engine block. but uh, <laughs> but you know, I think that was a unique point of view. Um, you know, I know Roy Thomas, obviously anything he writes has that kind of point of view, but um, mm -hmm. you know, but, but you know, the Marvel Comics is like you know, describing Marvel Comics is like the blind man with the elephant. You know, everybody describes a different thing, and you know, so um, you know, I, yeah. Anyway, if if you, if you haven't, if people haven't read it, they might find it interesting. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I'll, I'll say that I also appreciate um, the close eye that you have to to Stanley to Marvel. Um, to be someone connected and not someone who's sort of writing from the outside. And then I also appreciate both what you've talked about with Stan Lee and your upcoming work on Jack Ruby, just the the amount of research, the time, the the pouring over documents and talking with people that seems to be part of the process. Well, you know, for people like me, and I'm guessing for you, that's actually the fun part, you know, that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the danger of archival research is all the shiny objects like here's what I'm researching. But whoa, there's that other thing, you know, right. And suddenly yeah. kind of rabbit hole. I did want to, you know, you know, some I, I've seen people say, well, Danny had it was, it was an authorized biography of Stan. It was not. Nobody had any approval. Nobody had any say over what was in that book. Not, you know, nobody at Marvel, nobody, it's, you know, Stan did. I did two, but I think of the last interviews of, uh, with Stan because he did relent and do interviews after saying he wouldn't. But there was nobody who had any, you know, any say over what went into that book. So I know some of the people, you know, maybe because of my background, they think it was somehow authorized, but it was not. Yeah, yeah, that that is important to add as well. So, um, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that brings us down to the end and uh yeah it, did i miss anything that you want to make sure to add uh, as far as upcoming events? Me, my main social media really i'm old so it's facebook you know uh <laughs> and and you can also contact me at danny at dannyfingeroth.com i need to revamp the you know the website has tumbleweeds blown through it but with the new book i need to revamp it but certainly that that email and uh you know yeah you know, i'm on other social media too but the, but that's probably the the, the main the main two ways and uh and if you're at the san diego con uh come say hi yeah yeah i'll be sure that the the video will be pretty quick um yeah. and i'll be sure to release the the audio before san diego as well um and i'll also for listeners i'll tag your website as well as a space that they can go um directly to check out the jack ruby book from the publisher Okay, great. Or from the publisher or, or from Amazon as well. 
Okay. All right. Wh whatever oh, works best. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll put both on there. All right. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, take great care. Great talk. Bye, you everybody. too. Same here.